okay. It's a serious problem. I know. I'm not gonna go to the good place, but right now, it's well, I mean, I'm not right here. My, I don't have. Uh, <laughs> I've been on LP before now. So can I put that on the side? Okay. Everyone. I don't, I don't crave them. Yeah, you're uh, addicted to them. Come, come, come closer. We're, we're friendly here. No biting. Uh. I think we're gonna use this half of this stage. So if you want to get a better angle, come to this half of the stage. Um, we're going to be talking about neurodiversity. It is a theory that says that everybody's brain is different. Like, uh, physically, genetically. Everybody's heard like, oh, genetics, you makes your body a little different and that such, but uh, it also makes the brain different. That's not a good line. Let's do that again. The idea is that there's a spectrum of a quote-unquote functioning neurotypical brain on this side And this is the entire population of the world, the theory states. So this is eight, 8 billion people. Someone's here, and someone's here, and someone's here. Uh, in a graph idea like this, there's a average point right here. It's about one third of the way in. That's going to be the average person, right somewhere between there. But as you can see, the average doesn't count for everybody. Neurodiversity uh, used to be uh, only diagnosed. And that would be uh, somewhere somewhere between here, another third down, and anything beyond that. These, these, these are the people that used to be called neurodivergent people through diagnosis. And what that means is that they're the ones that got diagnosed with ADHD, diagnosed with autism, diagnosed with Tourette's, or dyslexia, and so on and so on. There's, there's many, many different diagnoses for these. Uh, the main takeaway with this theory is that everybody's very unique, and the, the line of diagnosis comes somewhere in here it's it's like somewhere between like from young people it's 10 percent two to 17 year olds 10 percent have been found to be diagnosed with adhd for example um, but as people get older they find mechanisms which reduce the these traits for diagnosis so this line somewhere here is is when you have five or more traits in in some specific neurodivergent uh, diagnosis process. 
Um, but that means there's five there. Um, it means somebody over here could still have one trait and they could still feel it very strong. Um, this theory assumes that most of the population is going to have some kind of physical difference in the brain that takes some of these diagnosed traits and, 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 and splits it up into only a few or less than five. Um, we are not going to be talking about who is diagnosed or not. We're going to be talking about the difficulties of diagnosis and, and why, why it's good to understand that anybody could have a few traits uh, from ADHD or autism, uh, the two most common, commonly diagnosed uh, neurodivergent disorders. Um, I don't like to call them disorders because it doesn't make you any less. It just means you work in a different way. So you have to find ways to work around your traits. Um, here's an example of why a neurodivergent person is not lacking or insufficient in any way. Um, I'm drawing here something somebody might call a keyboard. Somebody might call it a piano. Um, but let's say it is your task to Name the keys. It's your task to name the keys. Now, if you're in music class, most commonly you would expect to be naming them something like C, D, E, E, F, G and so on. I don't actually know music theory. This is probably wrong, but but here's what a neurodivergent person might read. Name the keys. Joe. John. Emily. and so on. Um, now, the difference between the people who answered Joe or, or C or D is that the other person assumed from context it is a music class. They're going to assume um, they probably want me to name the notes. Um, but it's not in the direction. It is not in the, the, the given task inherently. So a neurodivergent person might see that and, and, and realize that's not the question. It doesn't say to to name the notes of the keys. It, it says to name the keys. It's, it's very simple, very obvious. Like that's, that's how it works, name the keys. Um, oftentimes, uh, e even today, but more so 10, 20 years ago, 
that would be a person who would be instantly called stupid. We'd be like, oh no, they can't do anything right. They must be doing something wrong. But the issue was in the task given. It wasn't, it wasn't specific enough. Um, and, and, the way autism was figured out as something physical in the brain happened through very, very, very much studying very many processes. Um, in, in, uh, in, uh, 1992, they came up with this staged system where the neurological dysfunction is the stage one, step one. You're born with it. It's genetic. You can't change it. Uh, and then that would follow, um, it, it, it followed with a that difference meant that you don't you have a you have a lower ability to understand how others think and feel um because the way all of us work is we we project ourselves our own thinking onto others and see if it's similar in some way that's how we one of the many, many theories of consciousness states that, like, that's how we, we project ourselves. And um, a neurodivergent person, high, highly autistic person, is going to think everybody thinks their own way, of course, at first. And, and, and they're going to notice that people don't. People are really different. They're, they're weird. They're processed. They they talk they talk about the weather. Why? Just look at the sky. What's the point in talking about the weather? And and so on. That has has been a very long process to figure out where where those issue issues came from. Um and of course when when that happens, when you think that others are too different from you, you're not very social. Uh, which might mean you hang out with people less. And then you don't go to parties. And then you have a lower sense of s social skills by the time you're an adult. And it's a stacking issue. You can see how these small genetic differences in the brain can can really stack up when when you don't like a person, you don't like most people, you're going to shy away from people and then that's going to cause you to have less experience with people, which is going to cause you to run into even more social troubles when talking with other people. Uh, very, very tough. That little bit was about autism. Again, one of the traits. You need five <laughs> to get diagnosed. Um, if you're not diagnosed and you're thinking that sounds like me, it's very possible that you have that trait. Like I showed earlier, the, the the population graph, it's it's very, it's a lot of people. <laughs> Anybody could end up anywhere. And, and then there's, there have been a lot of uh, studies that have shown over-representation of these traits and diagnoses in certain groups of people, like poor people. Um, here in Finland, where I am, uh, 50 to 60 percent 
of uh, people who are, are not working have ADHD. That is not the whole population. Nowhere near as much, right? It's, it's five times more than the normal population. And, and we try to figure out why that is. And it turns out it's because of these stacking issues. With, you start with, you, you spawn with a brain, and then it, it tells you to do things differently. And it doesn't take you on the same path as many others. Um, let's talk a little bit about ADHD. Here, on one side, we have the dreamer type, and here we have Hypertype. Oh, also, I forgot. There's pens. There's a stack of pens back there. Anybody can grab one and doodle as they want to. Make yourself comfortable if you want to doodle and stuff. Um, grab a pen and, and go ahead and do it. And also, if you think of any questions throughout, uh, you can write your question down in front of you and I'll come look around after and answer those. Um, there's there's ge generally uh, two types of ADHD on a spectrum. Like everything else, you can have both types. You can have n n you, you can have mostly dreamer, mostly hyper. Or 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 twenty percent hyper and eighty percent dreamer, and so on. Now the differences between these ones is, these guys are stealthy. They usually don't get diagnosed because they know what's up. They're gonna get me if I act different. They might find out I'm different. So the the way the dreamer thinks is. There's an action, uh, like saying hi. Uh, if I say hi, how are they going to respond? The dreamer is going to think about three different options or more or less <laughs> about how somebody is going to react to me saying hi. Now, then there's going to be two more options. And this is before you even said hi. Uh, the dreamer ADHD types are very, very quick thinkers. Uh, they, they might come up with um, five different options for a, a dialogue with someone. And they're going to have that process thought out pretty far. Um, this is my type, by the way. Hi, I'm a dreamer type ADHD. I have a... <coughs> it's a... It's kind of like... Um, it's really difficult to pick one sometimes. Because maybe, because of your experiences, you might predict somebody to be mean. So you're very quickly just thinking like, oh, I can't say anything, I can't say anything. This is going to be wrong. Everything is going to be wrong. And let's say you do pick a path, and then your prediction is wrong. Well, now you're going to panic. <laughs> it's like, I wasn't prepared for this. <laughs> It's going to be a little bit of a social panic at that point. 
and then you're going to think of like, oh, maybe I should quiet down. Maybe I shouldn't have said anything. And, and there's a, there's a snowball effect that can start from that, that, um, builds up anxiety because you're thinking now you did something wrong. Now something else is going wrong. Everything's going wrong. I started it. And this is all in the head. Uh, meanwhile, someone hyper is just quickly going to do the thing. They're much more impulsive. Um, they're going to do the thing. And then they're going to notice something went wrong. And then they're going <laughs> to do another thing and something might have gone wrong again and they are very quick to say anything say the first thing that comes to their head uh which, which uh, often adhd people uh again a a group in which adhd is overrepresented is bullied people Again, a statistic here in Finland shows that over 30% of people who were bullied have been diagnosed with ADHD, which is three times more than the average diagnosis of ADHD between 2 to 17 ages. Um, did I get this? <laughs> Do you understand it? Yeah, okay. <laughs> it it seems I'm seeing some nodding. Um Let me see my notes. Um Oh yeah, memory. Memory is going to be bad with the hyper one. They can't remember things. They're on to the next topic before you notice. Um Again, we're not talking about the diagnosis of ADHD. These are traits that are found in ADHD. Um, usually, uh, someone diagnosed would land somewhere between these two. Uh, the hyper or the dreamer. Uh, the dreamer spends a lot of time in their head. And hyper spends a lot of time being impulsive. Uh, they are usually the ones diagnosed because they show it much more than others. Then the the dreamer types realize that, oh, I shouldn't act that way because then I'll get um detention. I'll get detention. And the hyper doesn't think that far. <laughs> they just think very quickly. <laughs> I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Um, this will Im impress my friends if I do this crazy trick. Um, uh, another trend that has been found is that this is boys. This is um, boys end up here and girls end up here. Um, the, one of the most important things to realize about ADHD is that it is a emotion control, uh, it's a, it's a lack, lacking ability in emotion control. So. What that means is um, you don't notice that you are stressed. Uh, you just have a, a level of being that you are and things happen. Stress level goes up. Stress level goes up. Somewhere up here is a break point when you, you flip out. 
you no longer care to keep taking the stress and you flip out. That's again with diagnosed uh, ADHD. One of the traits is is a lacking uh, ability in, in emotion control. Uh, you might be blind to realizing how much stress you're taking on. And then something happens and, and it, you, you spill over. Uh, another trait. We're going to get back to how we're dealing with these traits um, at, at the end. Here's a example for a trait uh, called context blindness. This one is very hard to figure out in in people. Um, also, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm I'm a I'm a soon to be second year student in uh, social services in Finland. Um, so all this information is from my classes about special needs uh, children and special needs clients. Uh, it is for us to figure out how to spot people that have these traits uh, so that we can address them uh, in a correct way. Um, there are a lot of people, sorry, I'm, I'm jumping topics. Back to context blindness. Okay. Imagine there is a person. I'm the person. I, I got a broom. I'm, I'm a groundskeeper. Okay. And suddenly, uh, a, a, a car drives up. I'm a, I'm a public service worker, groundskeeping, and and a car drives up right here. Big car, whoa! It's got lights and everything and wheel. It's on the curb. Why is it on the curb? And then two people come out. One of them carrying the other. And, and they run off. They leave the car right there. And I'm just like, what are they doing there? Why did the, why did the car just go there? This is wrong. They, they should not be parking in the curb. That's wrong. You're not allowed to do that. And, and get angry, you build up more stress. It's, again, emotion control. One of the traits, very common. Uh, you start wondering like, what the hell, what the, what the, <laughs> what is going on? Why did they drive there? The reason they drove there uh, becomes very clear once you get the context. Okay, I'm groundskeeping. I'm the groundskeeper for a hospital. For for first first aid services. And um the car that just drove there had someone injured in it. They did not have time to perfectly park. They went slightly over the curb. They're panicking. They want to get to the ER as fast as possible. Um, now this, this groundskeeper person might get, get really mad at them, yell at them for parking there and everything. But 
as we understand from the context, that's fine. It's gonna get handled anyway. There's no reason to stress over it. Um, but that is that is one of the traits uh, that are found in the diagnosis of autism. Um, again. If this seems familiar, that you, uh, another situation might be, uh, this is from a kindergarten. Uh, there's, there's two people playing a game. It's called swap your shoes. They swap their shoes. Then the game ends and they give one shoe back, but keep the other shoe. And then a uh, fight ha happens. They they start pushing each other. Give me my other shoe back. And, and now they're both angry. Let's do a twist there. We're zooming in on their faces. Um. The reason I drew this is to illustrate uh, a point here. Now, in this situation, two kids fought. They had a fight. Now, of course, you tell both of them that's wrong. Fighting is wrong. Now, someone with this neurodivergent trait of context blindness might understand that it was wrong all the way from starting the game. And it was, it was wrong all the way from there. So they never will play the swap your shoes game ever again. So sad. But uh, to add context to someone like that, we would have to split the actions in events. So, so this is the start of the game. You're okay. You, you go side by side with this person asking like, what do you think happened here? You started the game? Yeah, that's okay. You can start the game. And then they decide, this other person decides to keep the shoe. And you get angry. And here you push them. This this is wrong. Uh, here, when the other person decided to keep their shoe, that is okay. For the person reacting to it, they can't change that. It's still fine. They they're keeping your shoe. Unfortunate, but this is where you can make a difference. This is where you can decide, am I going to be angry? Or am I going to let it happen and ask for someone else, ask some help or something? That is how uh, a neurodivergent uh, person might, t might think. They might might have thought that this whole thing was wrong if they're told that what they did was wrong. Now, if you add context like this and, and they're specified that when you reacted with anger, that was wrong. It wasn't the game, it wasn't the fight, it was, it was that reaction. And then everybody could have had a happy ending there. And, and stayed friends and kept playing the game. Um, another another thing with context blindness is that there are so many things in our 
society and our expectations that assume a lot of context without realizing it. Something like, can you, can you turn the AC down? Um, if somebody's never been in a house with AC, they don't know how to turn it down. <laughs> you can't just say, turn down the AC. Um, you have to say how to. You have to give them step-by-step -step instructions on how to. So it's on the wall, it's a little dial. You turn the dial, make it say like 70. Maybe, if, if you're feeling cool that day. Um, so, uh, again, with context blindness, it's usually exams at school. Uh, they're fine uh, because exams have usually pretty good instruction on them. They are, they are there. They are predictable. And they have prepared for it. Um, but real life is, is, again, just so full of hidden context. Um, uh, someone with context blindness will very, uh, will give very strong, um, uh, be, uh, will will show that they are correct. They will say that they park the car on the curb. That is wrong, and it's very hard to start arguing with them. Well, they are at you're at a hospital. They had to park there quickly. Uh, they they are correct. They feel like they're correct because that's all they see is the the wrong parking that happened. As well as that, that can that can show up. Everything, everything I'm talking about is such a big, um, a spectrum. So, uh, one of the smaller ways context blindness can show up is in 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 the uh, in like. Uh, argument uh someone with context blindness might say that well this is how things are and and that that's that that's very simple for for like let's say a pol political topic they might say that some something awful about trans people and their their context for it is very streamlined. They're they're gonna be this thing leads to this thing leads to this thing. But the reality of the situation, reality of all all politics is that there's there's society, then there's family, then there's how you grew up, then there's everything you learned along the way, any relationships you had, everything, all of that. It's so complicated. And then you have the opinion. But oftentimes it's, it's so simple for these context blind people to, to, to just, this is how it is. This is it. I'm I'm right, and uh, without understanding the complexity of the topics at hand, um, that one I think uh, not that I think I know that one context blindness is again a very common trait of neurodiversity. Not something that is 
specifically diagnosed on its own, something that is one of the traits in autism. Um, Uh, and again, to deal with that, you just need to be constantly asking for more context. If you feel like you have context blindness, you you need to uh, tell someone to be patient with you. You need to tell someone to keep answering your questions because you need to know more. It's not that simple. You just need to have patience and and gather all the context. Uh, we'll talk more about emotion control later, which also has to do with context blindness very much because of how strongly you feel that you're correct. Um, <coughs> uh, again, very important to note, when you meet someone diagnosed, uh, you've only met one person who's diagnosed. You cannot say that, oh, I knew an autistic person once to another autistic person and have that autistic person feel like you understand them because that's a different autistic person. There's no way you know them. <laughs> uh, everybody's very, very unique. And, and and everyone diagnosed is extra unique. This makes them very special. I love them. Um, another common trait is synesthesia. Some people might have heard of that before. Uh, it's when you your sense experience. Is, is different. You have, um, you, you can, some people can uh, see other people as colors of personality. Some people can hear music and taste something. Um, this is a totally unique experience. I have no idea about feeling how that feels like. It sounds really wacky. <laughs> uh, and cool. Um, oh, another quick thing about dreamer type ADHD. They usually also dream. <laughs> they have dreams usually. Very, 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 very commonly. They, they also dream a lot. Um, is that Lena have a question? Mm-hmm. So between the dreamer type and the hyper type of ADHD, is what you drew there, is that also a spectrum based on the ADHD yes. spectrum already? Yes, everything is a spectrum. Mm, Everybody's so unique that we cannot have mm. uh, categories. I'm someone who has ADHD, <laughs> and I notice part of what I too is hyper but sometimes i end up slightly in the dreamer category trying to figure out what to do next and how people it's will, both yeah. <laughs> you can have both you can uh, imagine it like this is how much dreamer you have and mm -hmm. oh <laughs> this is how much um hyper you have you could be somewhere here and have both a bunch and over here and and oh. still have a bit of dreamer here even if you're very oh. hyper uh, very I'm much a spectrum that. everything's so unique and um there's another another source that has identified seven different types of adhd that still fall within those but to be more specific they 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 they're doing brain scans they they have that's how they have identified different areas of the brain activity going off and and so on uh that's how they made seven categories out of that but 
we're talking about traits. So, uh, uh, aut autistic people usually they they have another common trait called masking or or scripting. That means when you when when they enter a space, let's say a workplace, they are not being themselves there. They know how to be there, so they run a script. They they enter work mode. Um, uh, a lot of people have this different mode. It's not. Not to say that, again, none of this says that if you have this trait or that trait or all of the traits, it doesn't mean you need to have a diagnosis or anything. The only point of a diagnosis is to get help, to, to figure it out. <laughs> um, and if you have these traits, um, you can Google different sources. Um, now that now that you know that um, hyper and dreamer ADHD are different, you could Google like, oh, I have a I I I overthink. That's that's one of the dreamer type. That's a that's a more common term. Uh, Overthinking is what dreamer types do a lot. Um, overthinking can happen even if you don't have the dreamer type ADHD. It's all all a very very big spectrum of everything. Um, traits. Uh, special interests. Uh, another common trait. Really falling into one topic. Uh, Accountant, accounting, uh, data management, all that stuff is is usually very. Uh, it, it it's a neurodivergent friendly space. Uh, when somebody is really into one of those things, they they love to do it and they do it very well. They're usually also much better than the average worker in those spaces because it's truly their interest in in doing numbers or gathering data and making beautiful sheets of statistics and everything uh i'm nothing like that as you can see i didn't bring any <laughs> any boards or anything i don't i'm not really good at making visuals um yes every every person who's neurodivergent is unique you can never be like one neurodivergent is another or or similar to another um all only thing you have to focus on is the traits that each person has um because there are so many different types of diagnosed autistic and ADHD people, they are very, very different, and we we don't have a one solution for all. Uh, then we're going to talk about sensory overload. Um, this is a this is a trait of hypersensitivity. Um, again, a spectrum. It can be specific to one sensory system or uh, another sensory system or or many sensory systems. Or it can be really hard on the ears. Uh, people who like ASMR usually have uh, a more sensitive ear. Uh, stuff like that. Um, 
than for VR chat specifically. Um, hypersensitivity in VR chat shows up as as what we've called phantom sense, which is very interesting. <laughs> that's a uh, that's a neurodivergent trait. Uh, it usually means your brain is firing off in a different way than somebody else's. Um, again, everything's different, but not less. Uh, you just have to learn how to live with it, how to how to use earmuff mode, how to hide avatars if you feel uncomfortable because of how many people are surrounding you, if you feel claust claustrophobic from that, and, and so on. You, you do these. There's lots of tools for that in VRChat. Uh, personal space and, and so on. Uh, yeah, hypersensitivity. It's in, in, in VR chat. It's a visual and 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 uh, sensory touch combination. Uh, so you see something happen, and and your brain automatically says that, oh, watch out! There's some touching happening, and that's how you feel phantom sense. Uh, if you don't feel it, that means your brain is just different. Um. There are some people who have claimed to have learned um, phantom sensitivity, and that's uh, totally possible uh, under the age of 25, um, because the brain keeps developing. Uh, you can develop it within that time. Uh, I'm not really sure if it can happen after that. Uh, we don't really know. We don't study Phantom Sense and VR chat. There's not a lot of people for that. Um, and the goal is to empower anyone who is different. It is empowerment. It is to let them know that they are capable. Even if you have anger issues, you you constantly feel like you don't belong in a group. You have to know that it's it's not you. It's not your fault. There it's no one's fault. It's it's a circumstance. You were born as you and you have to be you have to learn to be happy as who you are. And uh any kinds of changes you make towards that um, usually requires other people's help and support. Um, then we're gonna go over the the most important tool for stress management this goes for everyone not just neurodivergent people everyone should be using this because you don't know if it might help or not this is a, a concept called the stress cup There's a tap there. Now, when something happens, uh, that you don't like, it causes stress. You, you list things that cause stress. You list things that make this surface go up. This is a, 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 a mug, a stress cup, and the liquid that goes in it is stress. 
as as a as a as a liquid you can visualize it in this way um the way you use this tool is you note down things you notice or remember making you feel stressed uh let's say it's people generally just people make you stressed i don't know how to write anymore i'm a little tired <laughs> it's past my bedtime i'm staying up for this um uh now then you have to figure out roughly how much that is Uh, so you can kind of get a sense of if I have to deal with people for uh, four hours of my day because of my job, my stress level is going to be somewhere up here. And then when you come home, if somebody is yelling at you, your parents, siblings, anybody, it's going to go up even more because you're trying to relax. And here's the other part you note down with using this tool is how to open this, how to open the, the tap for the mug so you can de-stress. So you write down things that de-stress you. Uh, for some people, it's a practice called mindfulness. And some people hang out with specific friends. Movies. Um... And the, the way you use this tool is you figure out what's stressing you throughout the day, when you need to relax. And this is a daily process. Um, this is how much stress you can gather in a day. If it ever spills over, that's the emotion control that you're lacking. If you get yelled at at home, you're going to yell back. You're going to smash the door closed. You're going to say, get away from me. I don't need this right now. Uh, because you've been overstressed. Uh, it, is, it is a neurodivergent trait to have trouble telling where your stress levels are throughout the day. So, uh, for me, I'm, I'm confused sometimes when I'm, I notice myself tapping my leg or biting my nails. Uh, I'm just like, what even happened? And then I, I try to think back on my day and I notice, oh, I'm way up here. <laughs> Some stressful stuff happened. And sometimes it can be the other way around. Like if you do too many movies, if you spend the whole day watching movies, <laughs> it might flip back around and, and close the tap and start filling it up again. This is a very careful Thing you have to notice like when when something is stressing you out more and and when it's working when are you actually being de-stressed when when can you actually relax uh, a lot of this has to do with the environment you're in if if you have a family that keeps yelling and arguing uh, you're you're very unlucky um, there's, there's, then that means you have to spend most of your day emptying the cup so you don't flip out.
I, I think, I think I got it. I think we're done. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, we have a question from the Discord. Can you hear me? I am behind the, the, yep. the screen. Hi. Um, so the question is, uh, when you were talking about the um, the dreamer kind and, and the, the other more impulsive type, is it possible that someone uh, kind of like maybe doesn't have both at the same time, uh, but maybe perhaps because of a panic or something like that, they switch between one and the other? Uh, that's a question from the Discord. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody's very unique. You can have any type of any of those, any combination of any of these traits. You can have all of these traits. You can have none of these traits. Or you can have a little bit of every trait. Or two traits. Or just, just any. It's very, very spectrum heavy. Does that answer the question? Uh, so it seems. Thank you very much. You're awesome, by the way. Uh, again, there are pens back there. Um, I would like to ask for everybody to try to write something down that you learned. Jesse, I have a question. I know recently yes. there have been a, a lot of studies that have been kind of diving into the correlation between gender dysphoria and neurodivergence. Can you speak to that a little bit? So, uh, the way I see it is, is this stacking problem. So, if you're born with a a type of brain that makes you feel left out easily and you're and you're forced to take on a role that doesn't fit you none of the friends you have are similar to you uh you're gonna feel different so you're gonna feel like you you need a different friend group some different people around you and um Oftentimes, because neurodiversity is, again, overrepresented, the, the diagnoses are overrepresented in, in trans people, uh, trans communities end up being more suitable to, to your type of friends, to your... The people who match your thought process is better than than most people. Uh, so a question here. Uh, what is the difference between ADHD and ADD? Uh, ADD is a deprecated term. It is no longer used in the... Mm. Uh, the diagnosis uh, yeah, terms. Like when, like when I was about growing up, when I was a kid, like I was thought I had ADD, whatever. So there is no technical difference between ADHD and ADD. Is is it just like not the, anymore? Said ADD. Okay, so basically, okay, so basically, people with ADD would be considered they have ADHD. Yeah, people with or... ADD look for the same help as people with ADHD. Uh, similar tools. Uh, Thirty things actually. Uh, and again, all the help that you look for has to do with the traits you have. It, it doesn't have to do with autism or ADHD. It has to do with what you have trouble with, what you want help help with. Um, it just so happens that a lot of these really helpful tools are usually labeled like 
uh, scheduling tips for ADHD people and, and so on. Uh, when in reality, it's just scheduling tips for anyone who wants a more visual uh, calendar or something like that. Um, because it's easier to uh, use labels for a masses of people to, to find your content. Uh, I guess I have a question. Yeah. Does um, trauma work differently on the ADHD? I mean, on neuro neurodivergent minds or about the same or whatever? Or does trauma. It, like, cope differently? Yeah, trauma. Emotional damage, whatever you want to call it. Um, trauma can occur differently because of the the way you think. So, like, uh, someone who is very hyper ADHD might have a lot less uh self esteem issues than someone who is a dreamer type because the dreamer type might end up in their head about all the comments other people make of them and blame themselves a lot and and feel worse because of that and then not end up not doing anything whereas the impulsive type would probably not even go that far and just just kind of be able to be more themselves and just kind of say like i don't care what you said uh, that's your thought uh that that's like one difference that I can think of right now. Um, depends on the traits you have and the kind of trauma you receive. One of the most common traumas for neurodivergent people is um, feeling like you can't do things um, and not being empowered enough throughout your life, not being told that you're capable, uh, just not getting enough compliments. It's very, very common because most people are uh, are are just just doing their days kind of kind of going about and 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 then then they have a friend group they have uh i'm talking like middle school let's say in middle school there's a, a friend group they're making jokes and then uh someone with uh neurodivergent traits in in like all these jumping thoughts might have a thought that goes from the third process down the line. Remember the dreamer type with all the processes? You could... Uh, a neurodivergent person might suddenly just say this one instead of the first step. And then everyone else is in the group is going to be like, What? That makes no sense. You're weird. So that's like one of the theories of of why like ADHD shows up all much more in in people who were bullied. Uh it's cuz they might say something that makes sense in their head, but to everyone else they they skip the step. <laughs> so they went straight to the Next one. Hmm. I have a question. Yes. Um, how do you heal from like something like um school um sponsored like ABA therapy? Where you're forced to learn uh that you're supposed to be a certain way. Uh, yes. Being put into a mold uh, is a very terrible thing. 
Um, no one should ever have to feel like they're being forced uh, to do anything. Um, uh, how to heal from it? Um, uh, well, you're free from that environment now, so so you can pick your own path. Um, I'm sure that can help with being more optimistic, believing in yourself, um, any kinds of empowering comments you get is going to help you, um, as well as um, just acknowledging more about uh, these traits. So understanding that you are literally physically different because of genetics. Um, oh, another thing. Your parents, if, if you have some of these traits, your parents are very likely to also have some of these traits, uh, which might is, is also another overrepresented statistic in people, people with domestic cases uh, have an overrepresented number of neurodivergent people because of the stress issue. They yell at each other a lot more. They don't know how to handle their stress very well, uh, which end up, ends up with their kids who also have neurodivergent traits to get yelled at even more and then they lose self-esteem and so on. It's a very terrible loop. Um, what we try to do in social service is uh, and, and teachers uh, teachers are the people who most notice uh, children with neurodivergent traits and get them the, the correct help. Um, again, the, the ways of helping have changed a lot uh, in the past 10 years, even five years, the, the ways of helping. Um, it used to be considered a disorder, which meant that it needs fixing, but neurodivergent people don't need fixing, they need accommodating, which is exactly the, the being put into a mold that you were talking about. Neurodivergent people need to be allowed to do things their own way. Um, which is usually very difficult for things like a working, uh, finding a job, uh, enjoying a job is much more difficult because of all these different traits that come with it. Um, I kind of have a question yes you said that um the the way we approach these things now changed a lot in the last 10 years is that also the case for for um how neurodivergence is being di diagnosed because i was I, I, my teachers thought i might have I, I think that term's not supposed to be used anymore, so I'm not going to use it. And um, so they sent me to a doctor, and that just went horrible. Um, the the way we diagnose has not changed, uh, because okay, uh, the people who do diagnoses are psychiatrists. Um. Uh, people who would obviously help you more would be uh, therapists um, because they're all about the individual, how you work, how, how you function, how your opinions are on things you want to do. Um, therapy is the best, best cure. Um, as well as any kinds of tools. Uh, friends who empower you, friends who accept you, 
as you are. Uh, if you're very impulsive and you end up saying the wrong things all the time and, and you end up feeling bad because you said the wrong things all the time, uh, uh, you need friends who tell you that it's okay. That's okay. You just you just went a little wild. That's fine. <laughs> um, uh, the diagnosis, the reason that it's still the same is because um, the process for uh, the medical system to apply and start using a new um uh, uh a book for for diagnoses uh, right now there's the dsm5 uh some countries uh, uh european countries use icd um icd10 and icd11 icd11 is uh, a newer uh but it's not yet translated to a lot of uh, european languages and the translations is uh, are are needed for a country with a different language to then uh, start using that, and that takes many 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 years. Uh, countries like Finland, where I am, we use ICD-10, which is uh, made in 1992, and uh, we started using it in 1997. <laughs> Um, it, it has a, a diagnosis called uh, transgenderism, which is uh, very ancient. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're, they're different fields. Diagnosis is a different field from the mental health field. Um, Diagnosis is a medical field, and uh, they 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 have very strict regulations on on how to do these things. So diagnoses are gonna be to get prescriptions or or to get benefits, uh, very by the book kinds of things. Uh, Whereas mental health help, uh, any kind of support groups, communities, uh, therapy, it's going to be more, more towards the, the right direction for anyone neurodivergent. <laughs> and you can never rely on just the meds to fix you. You always need therapy by uh, alongside, alongside the med. And, and I feel like that should that I mean, always therapy is for everyone. Therapy goes for everyone. Um, it. Uh, just curious, what kind of therapy do you recommend? Like psychodynamic or humanistic approach or? Is that kind of stuff you're not aware of? Um, uh, uh, there's, a, there's an old term called uh, casework that I think is the best one for neurodivergent people. It focuses on your environment, uh, changing, changing your environment to your specific needs. Um, so stuff like if you have sleeping troubles and so on you would get like a easy to follow schedule that is that works for you it might be visual for you it might be phone notifications for you or it might be notifications on the computer for you um casework focuses on on helping your an environment much more um uh, if you have the ab availability to choose the kind of therapy you're looking for, that's I, I recommend. Uh, uh, it's called uh, psycho uh, psychosociality. Um, Thank you. Uh, 
I, I have a question from uh, someone I, I'm uh, streaming this to. Uh, what what sort what sort of uh, things can can you do uh, uh, in order to uh, pe help someone who is neurodivergent to uh, feel more comfortable taking into account the difficulties they face? What things you can do to help a neurodivergent person feel more comfortable? Was that it? Uh, that's the gist of the question, yeah. Okay. Um, empowerment. Uh, genuine compliment uh, on their ability. Um, there's a concept in, in our social work called, um, uh, like, um, uh, I'm trying to translate it in my head. It's it's like um, positive. Uh, positive constructive feedback. And it comes from focusing on the things you did correct and then pointing out that was really good. You see, you made it, you did it. You succeeded at the thing you were afraid of doing, and nothing bad happened, so you must be pretty good at it. Uh, someone with social anxiety, for example, uh, somebody who's uh, deathly afraid of talking in, in VR chat. Uh, you can you can help them to take steps towards talking uh by letting them talk in a safe space for them so and then there's a process in the brain that goes like towards one because always this happens this always happens somebody always complains and somebody always says how i sound different wrong uh so they choose not to trigger that. Now, the more times they do it in a safe environment where nothing wrong happens, nothing terrible happens, it's safe. The more times you do it, re repeat it, they start to realize maybe it's okay. You know, it only happens sometimes. Uh, yeah, reinforcement, empowerment actually focusing on what they're doing correct that's that's going to help thank you anyone else I think we can end it here. Uh, and I'll keep hanging out uh, right here for more questions in private uh, off the stream if you feel more comfortable. Awesome. That was great. Thank you so much, Jesse. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you Jesse. So <laughs> thank, thank you. Yes. And thank you to Shay for interpreting for us. Yeah, thank you, Shay. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Shay. <laughs>